In the aftermath of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, a nation wholly indifferent to violence funded by their tax dollars is up in arms about the horrific tragedy perpetrated on American soil. As usual, mental health and lack of gun control have been blamed for facilitating the tragedy. Violence in the media has been cited for decades. One could easily make the argument that the glorification of violence in American culture has helped spurn the killers to commit their acts. They always seem to be wearing military fatigues, which, <laughs> false flag theories aside, marks an obvious association of their violence with that committed by the military. But instead of looking to the media to understand why individuals commit violent crimes, it's a little more useful to look at trends in the mainstream media to understand how the national dialogue around such tragedies has been molded to suit the lust for power of the state. The relationship between war and violence in most Americans is in many ways a calculated scheme that builds faith in the military and fear in the minds of Americans. As with all American tragedies, the citizenry looks to the most vicious perpetrators of violence to keep them safe. The American detachment from war, the most obvious and offensive form of state violence, is reinforced by an all too eager to pacify mainstream news. After Vietnam, the world's first truly televised war, foreign policy was censored and replaced with other wars for years. In the psyches of Americans, there have been multiple wars raging not outside the United States, but within. The war on drugs, on Christmas, on gays, on women, on Jews, on anything the media can find to plug in after war on. Everything but the war on peace, which defines the establishment. While the actual definition of war is armed combat, the term has been lost on the American people. Everything is a war except war right down to the trampling of victims at Walmart on Black Friday. Americans are inundated by war, but never the real kind. While blonde news anchors ramble on about how the freedom to worship Christ is under assault, the real wars perpetrated by the United States are only relevant as political footballs. The death counts of soldiers are just numbers, and if you can ignore them, then you can ignore the magnitudes more of foreigners killed, right? <laughs> How many Americans could tell you that 55 Iraqis died in explosions the same day three were killed in Boston? But who am I kidding? It seems like most American news consumers like being told that the Boston bombing is the most important thing in the world so that they can cry on cue and then know that if they forget all about it next week, it will be of no consequence. Violence at the hands of the state especially as depicted by Hollywood, permeates the national consciousness. Though Hollywood has a reputation for being liberal, remember George Clooney making a bunch of anti-war movies during the Bush years? When it comes to war and violence, it plays an essential role in the health of the violent state. Of course, slasher movies and mysteries rely on the atrocities of dark figures and alleys, but without fail, it is the authorities who are called to quell the violence and bring peace in Act 3. This violence from all angles is not merely a fetish of filmmakers or a response to market demand, but a systematic priority for the Hollywood lobby. Established by Jack Valenti of the LBJ administration in 1966. Coincidentally, it was just as such never-before-seen war crimes were being committed abroad. Members of the Motion Picture Association of America, <laughs> its CEO is now former Senator Chris Dodd, are responsible for rating movies to inform parents of what might be suitable for their children to see. The MPAA has made it blatantly clear that apparently violence is more appropriate for children than sex. The institution has been criticized repeatedly for its tendency to favor violence over sex and deciding what kids are allowed to see. Films with Homosexual sex are usually NC-17, as are films that show women having orgasms for too long. Sexual positions outside of missionary and female on top are NC-17 as well. Meanwhile, Saw, the six-part franchise that explores every possible way to murder someone, gets consistent R ratings. Get creative with sex, and it's porn. Get creative, creative with murder, and it's a box office triumph. But more effective 
at desensitizing the American public to violence as the glorification of military oppression as the force of good in American stories. In fact, any movie that wishes to depict the military is subject to Pentagon scrutiny and authority throughout the course of the filmmaking process. There are offices set up in downtown Los Angeles where military officials read drafts of scripts and submit them for further review to the Pentagon. It is during this process that Pentagon officials from the PR department make certain that the military is portrayed in a favorable light and that all equipment is accurate. From pre-production through filming, post-production, and right before release, the Pentagon has final say on the content of the films, or they get no military aid. For example, the 1986 Vietnam War film Platoon was rejected because it expressed doubts about soldiers' actions while in Vietnam. As a result, producers lost out on loans of military equipment in the making of the film. But by contrast, Top Gun, which was endorsed by the military and helped create a spike in Air Force recruitment, was filled with as many fighter jets as Tom Cruise's little heart could desire. More recent Hollywood war films have served to stoke the fear of Muslims, all in line with the military agenda. So when Americans are shocked when they are told to cry on cue for Sandy Hook or Aurora or Boston, they are pre-programmed to ask, where was the state to catch the bad guy? How could this happen in the United States of America, the beacon of freedom and morality? And they demand more state to solve the problem, just like they do in the movies. It is such that when a police officer murders an innocent person, it can be rationalized as a mistake caused by stress, lack of sleep, fear, a faulty weapon, or insufficient training. It is never indicative of the police force as a whole. But when a civilian dressed in military pants opens fire on a public school, there is no doubt that the very same state that terrorizes humanity worldwide should be called upon to make things right. When the armed state is perpetually depicted as the only force of good, it should be no surprise that a terrified public turns to it for protection. It's all they know. Because they certainly have no clue how many countries the current administration is bombing. Before the bodies get cold, lawmakers jump on the opportunity to call for more government regulation of self-defense after every tragedy that involves innocent Americans. Let the government protect you while you watch television. With the trauma inflicted on the ignorant American psyche, citizens are ripe to be exploited and ever willing to give up their rights to defend themselves. They are ignorant of the reality that the government commits more murder than all the school shootings combined while receiving a fraction of the coverage and from being plugged into state-sponsored media, you might never know that you're eight times more likely to be killed by a cop than by a terrorist. And so, a population is misled into believing the state will keep them safe. Our orders were to come down here and help out with security. Well, I know that Iraqis stand in line to come to this country. I love our troops. Uh, I wish I could serve myself, but, um, and I absolutely love our troops, so I'm a great patriot.